Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our discussion, which started with an assessment of Bernie Sanders and his proposal to break up the big banks. He called Wall Street the a fraud industry, or a model based on fraud. And we're discussing whether or not breaking up the big banks is one of the effective solutions. Now joining us again, first of all, from Toronto, is Leo Panich. Leo is the Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science at York University and author with Sam Gindon of the book The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire. And joining, joining us from Kansas City, Missouri is Bill Black. He's the author of the book The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. He teaches at the University of Kansas City, Missouri. Thanks for joining us, both of you. So uh, we're, we're back, gonna, Paul. if you haven't watched part one, you really should because we're kind of picking up this discussion or debate from there. Uh, Leo, you mentioned towards the end of the first segment that breaking up the big banks uh, is, well, first of all, you need big banks. Commerce needs big banks, but they don't necessarily need big banks the way they are. And you talked about banking as a public utility. So what does that look like? Well, you know, the alternative is, uh, you know, do you go back to the American dream, the liberal dream, the neoclassical economist dream, Adam Smith's dream, uh, that you can have a hidden hand of the market that will produce equilibrium if you have a lot of small actors in it uh, uh, and, and you, know, you aren't allowing two or three to collude together to set price. Uh, that's the traditional American model, advanced uh, you know, by sometimes radicals in the United States uh, and, and often uh, on the right by uh, the most rabid uh, inegalitarians. The other way to look at this uh, is in terms of this is indeed uh, very, very concentrated power, uh, 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 but you're not going to get any stabilization or you're not going to get a return to the uh, uh, small being eaten up by the uh, those who are, you know, either better at engaging in fraud uh, or more efficient or have more links to the state or what have you, uh, that that'll all happen again. Uh, so you need to look at something more fundamental, and especially given the financialization of capitalism, uh, uh, I think what needs to be raised, although it's very, very difficult to imagine uh, how this could come about given the political forces we have around today uh, is to think in terms of turning these giant institutions into public utilities. They play an essential role in the economy. Not, Of course, there's fraud, and I'm very had that, happy that people like Bill, uh, as I understand it, are engaged in trying to prosecute that fraud and expose it. Uh, but, but their role is much, much deeper uh, it, then can be expressed through the problem of fraud or indeed uh, just their systemic danger. The problem has to do uh, with the power of finance uh, and with the role of finance, the essential role of finance in relation to the, what ought to be a basic set of democratic decisions. What gets invested, where it gets invested, how it gets invested, et cetera. How do people get access to credit? Insofar so as, far as their wages have stagnated, they become more and more dependent on credit. Uh, and insofar as uh, they themselves are investors through pension funds in great numbers, uh, they themselves therefore have an interest uh, in the financial system. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I, I, it, there, no, that's not to say that I'm in any sense suggesting that there are the political horses to bring this about. And for that matter, I think that socialist economists uh, and theoreticians have done very, very little uh, in terms of trying to map out what a uh, public utility banking system would be. Some of the kind of work's been done in Germany, but not much. So and I'd like to hear Bill's response to this, actually. Well, go ahead, Bill. Okay, so again, uh, we've been, uh, people should listen to part one. Uh, this is uh, the context that I'm talking about is this is one of the reforms necessary. It doesn't solve uh, all problems and it doesn't largely address Leo's concerns about the world and financialization. But let, let's break down um, some of the things that he was saying where uh, I do 
uh, disagree. First, banks of this size that they uh, create a global financial risk are not necessary to our financial system and are not useful. In other words, most economists think that you get uh, all of your economies of scale uh, by the time you're at $50 billion in assets. Something like J.P. Morgan uh, is more than 40 times that size at over $2 trillion in assets. When J.P. Morgan fails, it will bring down the global economy. So, you know, why would we roll the dice every day, wondering when uh, the next one of these, again, roughly 50 worldwide um, systemically dangerous institutions is going to fail and take us into another great recession or worse. Second, they are an enormous risk to democracy. Uh, they uh, inherently will have immensely disproportionate uh, political power. Um, and they will that power will be in the hands of a very small subset of people who are not answerable to anyone other than themselves and um, their desires, which are, you know, typically pretty venal. Uh, third, uh, in all of this, it, it isn't a binary choice. Oh, you can have perfect competition. Uh, with, uh, you know, with thousands and thousands of uh, effective competitors, or you have uh, cartel. No. It, the closer you are to having uh, smaller numbers of really powerful institutions and more uh, smaller competitors, uh, the range of things that improve. And that range includes, first, it's really hard to form effective cartels. Uh, when you have uh, si very substantial numbers of major competitors uh, in things like foreign exchange. And so that, you know, life there improves greatly. Uh, let's take the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, while they had liar's loans as well in that whole area of the crisis that is familiar to Americans, uh, their biggest single thing uh, was the sale of this product uh, the supposed insurance product to anybody, normal people like us, who came into the bank to get any kind of loan. They would try to sell us this insurance product. And that insurance product, uh, this is uh, going to be quoting from a case or the facts of a case that was decided last year in the United Kingdom. The insurance company paid the bank a commission equal to 72 percent of the gross amount of the deal, right? If you understand the economics, the profit margin is so massive, estimated to be typically 80 percent, that the insurance company up front would pay the bank a 72 percent kickback of all the money it received because it knew that payments were so going to be so trivial under this supposed insurance product, right? In a, and the Tories, okay, the Tories, in their parliamentary inquiry that they controlled said that virtually all profits in the UK banks came from this deliberate policy of ripping off the consumer. And the right. Tories yeah. said, and nothing changed. No bank came in and ever tried to out-compete and say, you know, customers, you're getting ripped off by Lloyd's. Right. Come to our bank. We won't sell you this crap. Or if we sell it to you, you know, we'll sell it at one twelfth the price. Leo, just which would be the real price. Just to sort of finish this one part of this discussion about big banks, um, you say there aren't the political horses now, really, to pass legislation uh, that would enable uh, a public interest banking or banking as a public utility. I must say, it's not clear. There's enough political forces even to, to break up the big banks, for that matter. Of course. Of course. Um, but that being said, um, there was a moment during the crisis when there were a lot of commentators, I'm talking about 708, who were talking about a, what a Swedish model of actually nationalizing at least some of the institutions that were really on the, on the edge of bankruptcy and would have obviously gone bankrupt without massive public bailout funds. Um, so and there are moments or windows where one could imagine such a thing as possible. But that being said, is short of banking as a public utility, uh, 
is breaking up the big banks a step towards a better Well, I want to know a lot more about it. System. I want to know who they're being broken up among, uh, whether it's going to be the same families that will own these various banks or the same concentration of institutional investors. Uh, you know, uh, I'd, I'd want uh, evidence uh, that the kind of, uh, you know, shysterism uh, that is indeed embedded in the system uh, and that Bill was describing uh, a, a particularly egregious example of uh, wouldn't be replicated. Uh, there's all kinds of examples uh, of that kind of ripoff uh, occurring, and, and in banking especially. Uh, Bill, you know, when Bill says if you have entrance into the system, they would challenge this. It's very difficult to enter into the system, uh, and and I'm not sure that that doesn't get generalized. Uh, even among smaller institutions. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just say... And I just want to say something about Sweden. Uh, yes, they, they nationalized them and then gave them back to the 15 families that own Sweden. And the great crash in Sweden was a result of Sweden being the first to deregulate its financial market in 1985. Uh, so, you know, this one should be careful about, uh, you know, looking to Europe. Uh, uh, which isn't actually a very good example. Yeah, Deutsche I, I Bank think with the Swedish model, has been... the idea of the Swedish model is you could nationalize, but you don't have to do the second half of the Swedish model in your scenario, which is you don't have to give them back again. Well, be, that would be something very different. And then social democracy in Sweden would finally have had to do something about the deal it made with those 15 families in the late, late 1930s in exchange for union recognition. Uh, you know, will let you control and own the economy uh, in exchange for a strong labor movement and a more egalitarian welfare state. Right. Okay, uh, let me just ju jump in here. The, as far as I know, in terms of detail of how that breakup would look, um, I, we have not yet found Bernie Sanders articulating that. Um, he did propose legislation in 2013, which was the uh, Too Big to Fail, Too Big to Exist Act. But the legislation, as far as we can see, is about one paragraph long. It calls for breaking up the big banks, but doesn't yet deal with the kind of detail you're asking for, Leo. Um, I, I, but, but in terms of the regulatory environment, uh, and, I, and Bill's been making this point, it's not just about breaking up big banks. Um, the other thing that uh, Bernie Sanders has been calling for is to return to, to Glass-Steagall. And uh, so what, why is that important, Bill, and how significant is it? Well, can, let me just do uh, 20 seconds on the last topic. Uh, what you certainly could do uh, is have a consumer bank through the postal system, and that would allow uh, customers uh, to have a broad range of banking services, uh, and uh, that would be a public utility-like thing, and you wouldn't let them invest in anything exotic, so you'd uh, prevent a lot of the abuses where you have state-owned banks, and uh, as uh, Leo was talking about, in Germany are, af after all, part of the problem. Uh, but uh, you can do that through a postal system. Uh, and that can work quite well. Okay, well, now that you've introduced that, let's stay on that for a second, because Bernie Sanders recently has advocated just what you're saying. <clears throat> and so let's talk a bit about that then. Uh, what, what do we make of using the postal system uh, as, as a banking utility? Leo, does that start to get at what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I, I think if one's talking about a reform that is possible, uh, you know, given the balance of political forces in the United States, that's a damn good one. Uh, given the appalling treatment of the American postal system by the American Congress, which is essentially trying to do away with it. Uh, moreover, it would be a way to save the postal system right. in the age of the Internet. But beyond that, what has developed in the United States, uh, especially, uh, but as usual, Americanization is a model for the rest of the world, is what uh, one of... Uh, my political economy colleagues here in Canada, Suzanne Soderberg of Queen of Queen's University, calls in a recent book "Debt Fair States and the Poverty Industry," uh, and you get uh, this these credit institutions, often small, uh, which are making the kind of ripoff on payday loans uh, to poor people uh, 
that are very, very similar to what Bill was describing in the British case. And if you had a postal system of, of credit provision to poor people, especially to ordinary people, uh, this could be a way of getting those shysters out of poor people's pockets. Bill, anything you want to add to that before we talk about Glass-Steagall? No, I think this is an area we have substantial agreement. You do have to worry about corruption. Uh, people don't know that the uh, Japanese uh, Postal Service was the largest depository institution in the world, but the Japanese opened up its uh, investments to allow it to be used to manipulate things That's like right. the Nikkei. Uh, average, so you, you uh, nothing works without eternal vigilance uh, and transparency to the, the greatest extent, but people have to stay involved and uh, keep them trying to do the right thing. I would mention that um, payday lenders may look small. Uh, they're actually um, very large uh, enterprises, and they're frequently sure. a bunch of small things are actually owned by the same group of uh, small group of people. Yeah. I mean, as long as the political class is so beholding to Wall Street, uh, most of these reforms are questionable because what winds what winds up getting passed through Congress and and through the the president is usually pretty much in the end what Wall Street wants anyway. We're talking about what policy we think would work and we're trying to make sense of what Bernie Sanders is proposing. So so let's move on with with the issue of Glass-Steagall. Uh, one of that is one of Bernie Sanders' main other pillars of his policy about how to deal with Wall Street. Uh, Glass-Steagall, if uh, if I state this correctly, gentlemen, please correct me if I don't, essentially separates uh, consumer banking normal commercial banking from more derivative speculative banking. Institutionally, they were supposedly supposed to be separated. Uh, if I understand it correctly, over the course of the 1960s, that kind of separation was kind of being whittled away anyway and was completely gone when they got rid of Glass-Steagall, which was passed, what, 1933, I think it was, during the midst of that crisis. So, Bill, Bill why would reenacting Glass-Steagall make such a difference? So first, the uh, Glass-Steagall was enacted as a result of the PCORA investigations of the Great Depression in terms of the real abuses, and it responded to a real abuse, and it worked brilliantly uh, for decades. So we violated one of the central rules of life, which is if it ain't broke, uh, don't purport to fix it. Uh, second, you are correct that starting in the 60s, um, but pretty mildly for the next 20 years, uh, but then kicking heavily into gear uh, in the mid-1980s uh, and on. Uh, the Fed, in particular, led an unholy, unholy war to uh, administer the death of a 1,000 cuts to Glass-Steagall by creating regulatory exceptions. Uh, and therefore, by the time Glass-Steagall was repealed, it was uh, considerably less effective. The fundamental idea is uh, to, that, hey, deposit insurance is different, right? It's for smaller people to protect them, uh, and if we're going to have uh, deposit insurance, then you know you need regulation, and so banking, uh, com what, what's called commercial, and you, you said consumer banking, uh, that's where that sphere is. We're going to have a federal subsidy, deposit insurance, but we're going to limit it to this activity, and we do it as a compromise uh, to uh, prevent the, the most destructive runs. But there was never any rationale. And by the way, per it's particularly weird when conservatives and libertarians support the repeal of Glass-Steagall, because that means we would extend it to investment banking, and investment banking means taking an ownership position. In other words, Merrill Lynch owns a company or owns a, company, a chunk of a company. Well, why would we want to have a federal subsidy that would help some people outcompete other folks who didn't have that same federal subsidy in an ownership position. I've never understood why libertarians, in particular, uh, aren't appalled uh, by the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Also, it's just playing a whole lot riskier. Every single one, all five of the uh, big five investment banks in the United States, uh, 
uh, would have failed but for the bailout. And three of them, despite the bailout, uh, went out of business as independent entities. In other words, the whole investment banking model is as risky as commercial banking uh, was shown to be, investment banking uh, was closer to taking cyanide. Uh, so why in God's name would we provide insurance to that activity, especially because there's no need to provide insurance to that activity. If you do, either explicitly or as we had done implicitly through too big to fail, uh, provide a federal guarantee, you incentivize them, goes the standard economic argument to do wilder and crazier and, of course, more fraudulent things. All right, Leo. Well, you know, I think Bill is, is right to identify when it started coming apart. One needs to remember that what Glass-Steagall was doing, I mean, apart from, you know, when you took your $5 into the bank and the bank manager said, no, don't put that in a deposit account. I've got a great mine in Peru that you can invest in, uh, protecting uh, that person who brought it in. Uh, it was also stabilizing the banking system. And the role that the uh, Treasury and the Fed played through the post-war era was bringing American finance back to uh, not only health, but a very dynamic role in the world. Uh, Glass-Steagall already began to break down when uh, commercial banks, the very, very large commercial bank, Citibank, was able to say, look, this isn't, uh, we're able to do investment banking in London. Uh, what sense does it make that we can't do it in New York? Uh, and increasingly, uh, because of the uh, globalization of multinational corporations and the development of the euro dollar market in London and much more, uh, it was very difficult, given the internationalization of finance, for the New Deal regulations not to be eroded. Uh, you're right, Bill is absolutely right to date it, that it really exploded in the 1980s, uh, this, this dissolution of the watertight compartments between investment and commercial banking. Uh, it wasn't just a matter of the Fed uh, doing it by a thousand cuts. Uh, it was doing it in relation to the dynamics of... Uh, the financial system, and under a lot of pressure, of course, uh, from financial uh, uh, from uh, commercial banks who wanted to get into the business, uh, but there was pressure to do this as well from institutional investors, uh, and even from industrial investors. And the world has changed. When you go into uh, a bank, gets your money now not by you opening a deposit account, and, it, and this has been the case since the late '50s, but often by selling you a security. Uh, the, the banking has been securitized. And in that sense, uh, that line is very, very difficult to draw. I think by the time Glass-Steagall was repealed, and sure, you know, it was all kinds of enormous pressures uh, that were dastardly pressures that finally took it away. But by the time it was repealed, and I think Bill was largely saying this, the horse had already bolted. And it had bolted because uh, the barn door was, you know, so worn away by the way capitalism had evolved over the post-war era. Okay, we're going to pick this up in the next segment of this series of interviews. We're going to talk a little more about Glass-Steagall. And uh, please join us with Leo Panich and Bill Black on The Real News Network.